Thank you very much for waiting or for joining. Um, I'm very happy now to introduce this third panel of our opening festival of Goethe Institute in Exile, which is a cooperation, the start of a cooperation actually as well with the Deutsche, Deutsche Zentrum for Integrations and Migrationsforschung, the DEZIM, which will be uh, um, as well another conversation series that we are starting here today and which will follow up until uh, November. And um, Caroline might say a little bit on this as well. But we are here now on, on, uh, within the context of Goethe Institute in Exile. And the topic of this talk will be um, the scopes for cultural policy. And um, I think this is something as well that deals exactly with the topic of, of Goethe Institute in Exile, why we have Goethe Institute in Exile as well, and what does it mean for cultural, cultural policy makers as well, what does it make, mean for, for activists, for cultural producers. So I'm very happy that we have this panel here with you. And I will hand over the microphone to Carolina Sat from Dezim. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mike andre Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on a Saturday night to talk about cultural policy and shrinking spaces. I think there are other things that you could have been doing. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so my name is Caroline Assad, as Marc André said, and I work at the German Center for Integration Migration Research, DEZIM. Um, I'll be moderating this discussion. Um, and before I introduce the panelists, I would like to say some introductory thoughts about the topic of today, so bear with me. Um, this dialogue series that we're kicking off right now is a cooperation between Goethe Institute, DEZIM, and Open Society Foundations. I'll say something at the end of our panel discussion on the next events, on the coming up events. Um, and today's event wants to reflect on um, the value of culture in difficult times, and especially when spaces are shrinking because of illiberalism. So I'm assuming that all of us who are gathered here share a firm conviction that culture and arts matter also in difficult times, but this is not always an obvious or clear fact in society. Sometimes we see arts and culture treated as secondary or non-important when there are more um, perhaps hardcore events um, happening. Um, and it seems to me that all of us who share this conviction should do the work of translating and explaining the ways in which culture is essential, also in times of upheaval or even in war. Um, of course, culture is also no recipe against inhumanity. In a, title, in a lecture titled Kultur and Culture that Adorno gave in 1958, um, he compares the concepts of culture in America and in Germany at that time. Um, and there he analyzes the ways in which high culture was complicit in the atrocities of the Third Reich. Um, he points out to the simple example of Nazi officials listening to high classical music um, after they have committed crimes in concentration camps to help them relax. And so um, this decoupling, his thesis is that this decoupling and depoliticization of culture makes it possible to indulge in culture or enjoy culture um, as well as continuing to um, behave in an inhumane way. So arts and culture are not recipes against inhumanity or brutality that we know. Um, they might even be used to justify a myth about a superior race to wipe out another one. Um, but while it is certainly a misconception that arts and culture might protect us against violence, it is also a misconception that um, that their value does not go beyond that, and that precisely for that reason, um, they are essential also in times of great collective distress. Um, if cultural and thinking spaces were closed in, uh, or bombed in Kiev and were closed in Russia and other authoritarian regimes, this does not mean that they weren't functioning or didn't uh, fulfill their purpose. Um, the artists who um, and authors who dare to take risks and um, continue actively creating, um, who dare to shock conventional ways of seeing um, and 
uh, present us with ways of being that do not fit within the status quo. Um, they are fighting often against systems of oppression um, in so many ways before even physical wars began. Um, and this festival sheds the light on exactly the work of these artists. And so what is important that we talk about the political context and the policy context that make, that put them at risk, but then also that might make their work possible, that can support them. Um, and it is likewise important to highlight the initiatives um, that might be able to support this work and to define together the conditions under which this work can become possible. Um, today our guests have each a very unique positioning um, and a unique perspective on this field. Um, for some of them, shrinking spaces are not just a theoretical concept, they have actually lived through it, they had to close down their cultural practice and leave. Um, Jakob Ratschek, who has recently started his uh, new position as head of the information department at the Goethe Institute in Munich, head uh, department, um, was previously working as head of the Goethe Institute in Minsk, um, which had, though, to stop its activities due to the uh, repressions of the Belarusian regime. Thank you, Jakob Ratschek, for joining us. Um, Dima Albitar Kalaji. Um, is a writer, curator, cultural journalist, and a podcast producer. She has worked in Berlin since 2013, and before that in Damascus. Um, she's a co-curator and editor in the uh, project Weiter Schreiben, or Writing On in English, um, at the Berlin-based organization Wir Machen Das, um, which cooperates with authors in exile and supports them throughout their writing and publishing processes. Um, Dr. Jens Adam works currently at, um, on, on the issue of soft authoritarianisms and cultural policy at the University of Bremen. He has also conducted research, um, field research on German external cultural policy at the Goethe Institutes in Sarajevo and Ramallah, um, regions that are also not free of conflict. And last but not least with us from Lviv today uh, is Anthony Richter, director uh, or Richter, probably, Director of Special Initiatives at the Open Society Foundations. He joined Open Society in 1988 and established more than 20 of the foundations in the Open Society Foundations network um, throughout Eurasia, the Middle East, and South Asia. He also developed programs such as the Revenue Watch and Open Society's work backing the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture. Thank you so much for being with us virtually today, Anthony. Um, so I would like to structure our conversation around three themes maybe that might also be overlapping, but just for the sake of um, having uh, covering all of these topics. So one of them is the resilience of culture and shrinking spaces under authoritarian rule. Another one is civic engagement and cultural work in the diaspora. And the third one is the level of cultural policy and funding instruments. Um, and I would like to start by asking Dima, um, what is the value of culture for you personally and professionally in difficult times? Well, um, thank you. <laughs> and good evening, everyone. Um, well, culture for me is a very essential aspect of my life and that's why it's, I think it's really very frustrating whenever something happened the first thing that the government think to reduce is the culture events and the culture support uh, while when we see I think um, very much of our information about the ancient civilizations we got from uh, writings from uh, paintings from sculptures and until now we still think and communicate culture as uh, a, as if it's a privilege to have or something on the side and not very essential and core from our everyday life um, and the other day I was listening to the New Yorker podcast, poetry podcast and the uh, poet I hope I remember the name right her name is Sandra Sessonneres, 
and she said we need poor poets than politicians. And I think she's very right on this. <laughs> um, so culture in difficult times, I think it's really way more needed than even when there is nothing happening. And there is always crisis. And fortunately, we always live in a world of crisis. So the role of culture is continuously changing and depending on how, how what's going on. So you speak about the aspect of documentation informing, of preserving, right? Actually, one of the ways, because people, I think literature, because I can maybe talk about it more, literature, for example, novels are one of the, I think, very true and trusted documents that last of a period that is happening and how li how people perceive this, what's happening, and what happened back then, and how it did affect people's life, and it covers many perspective. I think maybe sometimes historians don't have so, and people usually read novels more than they read a history book. Yeah. Thank you, Dima. Anthony, um, does this resonate with you? You are supporting the physical presence of this Ukrainian institute here in cooperation with the Goethe Institute. And obviously, you are someone who cares deeply about culture. You have supported artists in times of conflict. Um, can you tell us what you have observed in terms of shrinking spaces or the tightening of creative freedoms? Well, uh, good evening from Lviv. It's kind of a, a, a somewhat ironic, uh, but a reaffirmation uh, that there's a, I'm joining you from one cultural festival in Lviv, uh, one that is a gathering of uh, international writers in solidarity with uh, Ukrainian uh, intellectuals, writers, uh, and, uh, and their allies here. Uh, I agree with uh, what Dima said. Uh, I think that uh, in times like this, uh, the need for uh, uh, what art and culture can provide is, uh, is heightened. I think there's a, a great demand for uh, expression, bearing witness, uh, documentation, communication. Uh, there's the need for the kind of reflection that uh, comes uh, through the arts, uh, helping audiences and communities to uh, interpret and understand what they're going through, which can be uh, so uh, painful and, uh, and so uh, confusing. Uh, and it's also a medium of solidarity uh, for people to see themselves and their lived experiences represented, but also to communicate and uh, share those uh, experiences with, with others who want to support them. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, you know, you talk about shrinking space. The, the war here is the you know, ultimate shrink, uh, attempt to shrink physical space by invading a neighboring country and to shrink its space uh, to nothing and to fill, uh, to replace the free expression and vibrant uh, uh, creative and political culture here with uh, that which exists in Russia, which is a, uh, a desert, a void of, uh, a, a, of freedom. So it's also, and it's also a campaign of erasure, denying uh, that there is a Ukraine, that there is a Ukrainian language and identity, uh, and that which does exist should be erased. So. Uh, the, uh, the, the problems you're laying out, Caroline, about the shrinking space are very, very much present in this conflict, uh, this, this uh, full-scale invasion uh, stage of the, of the war where uh, Russia declared aim is to uh, completely uh, erase uh, Ukraine as a people, as a culture. Uh, so uh, the, the, what cultural activists are doing is uh, extremely vital at the moment. Thank you, Anthony. And if I may stay with you for a moment, because you not only have the perspective on Ukraine, you have also worked on supporting 
um, funding for culture in different regions of the world. Is there perhaps an expansion of cultural freedom and resilience where you wouldn't have expected it? I mean, certainly when one looks uh, at uh, the resilience uh, of the women of Iran and uh, the, the power that uh, music uh, has played, uh, I think people are aware of the song that's been written and the way that that's been taken up as a, a banner of uh, anthem of uh, their struggle. Uh, one wouldn't necessarily expect uh, to see that presently. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, where the Taliban are carrying out a war again uh, that is against culture in many ways and is misogynist in its core, uh, uh, we see uh, still groups uh, trying to continue Afghan culture uh, outside the country, like art lords, uh, whom we're supporting to provide uh, cultural relief uh, to Afghan refugees who, uh, who feel uh, culture as an inherent uh, part of their uh, well-being. Uh, so yes, we see that uh, even in uh, really extreme situations, uh, you see Uh, people's demand uh, for cultural expression and a determination to uh, to uh, use that uh, as a way of uh, taking care of themselves and advancing uh, popular movements. Thank you, Anthony. And we'll come later also to the point of diasporic engagement and supporting culture from exile. Um, Jakob Racek, you have experienced shrinking spaces in a very practical and real way. Um, the Goethe Institute in Minsk that you led had to close. Can you tell us something about the signs leading up to that, the actions leading up to that? Did you try to prevent it? Did you see it coming? Okay. Um, so I have been working in Belarus since 2018. Um, Funnily or ironically enough, uh, it was my first post as a director of an institute and then right away it, I was kind of the last director to close uh, the institute or to cease our activities in the country. And when I arrived there in 2018, I have to say it was kind of a, a totally different situation from nowadays. It was a let's say, a, a period of um, lib liberalization and opening up uh, also to the countries of European Union. Um, so I would say the first two years I didn't see any signs. I rather, and probably we will talk about it later as well, I rather encountered a kind of mild form of um, um, soft um, authoritarian regime and even the people in the country kind of, they were already quite tired of this regime and didn't believe so much in its strength. Um, and uh, it actually, the first signs of uh, a change, a change to the worse, started with uh, the pandemic um, in 2020, when uh, the government simply decided, or the regime simply decided that uh, this pandemic is not going to happen in Belarus. So they just ignored it. And then something very interesting uh, happened. Uh, and that was that um, people kind of um, compensated this fact that the regime was ignoring the pandemic and they started to self-organize them and they started to uh, participate and uh, show a lot of solidarity. So a very kind of basic and horizontal movement started and a movement without a center. So it was very decentralized um, activities that mobilized more or less the whole society. And uh, this dynamics uh, then directly continued in uh, what we know as 
the revolution in Belarus uh, before, during and after the elections. Some theoreticians also call it an evolution because it really started quite slowly and it didn't come to an end yet. Um, so this kind of um, horizontal solidarization between the people kind of um, had a very strong resource in arts and culture uh, and I, maybe we will also talk later more about it but uh, it's quite obvious that uh, culture is not only as a form of expression but also as a form of organizing the social space uh, as a form of uh, empowering any kind of collaborative processes um, had a very important um, important meaning for the society and um, it's no surprise that the regime very quickly also started its repressions exactly in the cultural sector and as we all probably know some of the most important protagonists of this revolution or evolution are people who are very uh, deeply rooted in culture, like Maria Kalesnikova, for example, uh, director of a cultural hub called Okashes Nazit, which actually closed exactly today, two years ago. Um, so she's a typical representative of a free, um, open cultural scene, same as uh, Viktor Babarika, the um, former candidate, president candidate who is now also in prison uh, and he uh, was one of the most important supporters of uh, independent cultural scene in Belarus. So the science started maybe in 2020 with pandemics and then of course around the elections but still us as an institution, as a Western institution, we still believed uh, that we can continue our work and I would not have decided differently back then so we stayed more than one year after we were even asked to cease our activities. I mean, to be asked after we were forced to cease our activities in 2021, we still stayed as a kind of uh, underground institution for over one year. And then, but I will talk about that later, maybe then we really had to yeah, leave the country for certain reasons. Um, and just one follow-up question on that. You have mentioned culture as a, a form, I think you mentioned it, of organizing social space. And um, I've heard you before say that cultural institutions played a very important and just practical way of supporting the revolution or in this self-organizing. Could you say a bit more about this? Hello, yeah. So maybe I'm coming back to your uh, quotation of Adorno because he, uh, he referred to kind of official institutions and high culture and I'm not talking about that sector or that field. Uh, I'm really talking about the free independent scene which was very strong in Belarus uh, because exactly the institutionalized scene was so in a, such a bad shape so a lot of things happened exactly um, on a more horizontal level and more independent uh, and free uh, level or level of a free scene. And just to give you one example, one of the most important funding source in Belarus was not the Goethe Institute or not Open Society Foundation, but crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding where really people donated very small amounts uh, to make some like seminal uh, art projects and artworks for uh, for everyone, for the whole society. Um, and this is, for example, one way how the society organized itself, same as with the pandemic example. Um, and this was also the first thing that the regime did uh, after the repression started. They closed down all the crowdfunding campaigns because what happened was that exactly like f from one moment to the other, uh, crowdfunding started to work also as a way how to support the protest. Um, so cultural pro projects kind of 
very quickly transformed also in projects of protest and projects of um, the fight against the regime. Thank you. Um, Jens Adam, you work with the term soft authoritarianism. How is that different from perhaps a more classical or hardcore form of authoritarianism as we've just heard from Jakub Racek? Well, um, I think in many aspects, let me, just, uh, let me just mention two. So first of all, we use the term soft authoritarianism. So we, that's a research group in Bremen, so I have colleagues and they work on other countries. I work on Poland. So we, we uh, use this term for governments which are democratically elected, so, so which have sometimes won large majorities and they use their legitimacy to um, gradually but systematically undermine principles and processes and institutions of liberal democracy without leaving the nominal frame of democracy. So basically, um, they do a lot of little things in, let's say, intervening in, in the judiciary or um, hijacking public institutions, for instance, public TV and transforming public TV into a propaganda tube or changing um, educational curricula in that sense that um, openly anti-liberal um, ideologies become just normalized in, um, in, in the daily uh, school curricula. And they do all this at many, at many different, at many different um, um, societal spaces, we could say, um, without arguing we are transforming democracy into post-democracy or whatever. Or, uh, so they still say, actually, in Poland, they would rather argue that we finally realize democracy because we give voice to people that haven't had voice before, for instance. So they would remain in this, in this discourse of democracy. And that's, that might be specific. And another aspect which is specific, I would say, is the role of violence. Because, I mean, in Belarus, you have, of course, uh, uh, you have, of course, tanks on the street, and, and you are very much uh, you are very much threatened um, by, by by state violence. And I would say, in Poland, we have as well state violence, but rather directed to migrants uh, who try to cross the border from Belarus, for instance. So, so rather, I would say, at the margins, you know. So you have rather violence at the margins, but. But um, I wouldn't see that violence in the sense of physical violence is really an ordering, structuring principle of, um, of the political space in Poland. And that might be different, quite different to, to Belarus. And that probably also has implications on the work of cultural institutions as well. It has, uh, whereby Poland is not lost yet. It's quite interesting because uh, you have in Poland uh, different levels and for instance cities um, are mostly governed by the opposition and therefore it depends a lot um, where does the money come from but when we talk about uh, the, the national level yes so it has has big implications um, I just read an article in in the Gazeta Wyborcza two days ago and there they wrote for instance that they uh, that the government uh, created 40 institutions th since they won the elections in 2015 or perhaps 38 so so something around 40 not all of them cultural but a lot of them cultural and and to a certain extent they create institutions which should do something which an existing institute institution already does so they are doubling in a way duplicating institutions and are um, in a way um, giving them the mission um, to, to somehow promote certain, certain let's say, um, narratives about history, certain anti-liberal policies and so on. So that might be one strategy, to basically create new institutions. Another strategy might be to, um, to um, change just the leadership in certain cultural institutions or to cut fundings um, or not to buy any more the artworks of critical artists, for instance. So, so basically, these little, these little um, changes, which can matter quite a lot. And I would like to mention as well um, uh, something we could call flooding the public space with certain narratives, for instance, about that the LGBT movement is attacking Polish families or that um, migrants are, um, as such, 
dangerous and uh, illegal. So, so basically narratives which are then um, um, uh, reproduced day per day in the main news, uh, in the main news uh, um, um, uh, broadcasts. Uh, and basically, I think what I'm trying to say is, so they flood the public space so with these narratives. And, and as an artist or as an as a writer, you have to to deal with these narratives. You 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 have somehow to position yourself to that. So I think that's as well one 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 way so of um, um, yeah of reducing reducing uh, uh, spaces for cultural expression. Yeah. Thank you. And that probably becomes more volatile because these narratives are connected by a global right wing rise and. We also see them here to some extent, but not in the same. Not well, to I mean, the, same the difference extent. is uh, that they, um, in a way, like um, hijacked uh, public TV and, uh, and public radio, and I think this makes a big difference. If you are able to, to day per day somehow reproduce and uh, mobilize these narratives, or if they are just one narrative and and uh, mobilize these narratives as normalized as the norm, yeah. So, so that makes a difference than if. This is just one voice among others. Thank you. Um, and so, as you're saying, as spaces shrink, people also have to find other ways of cultural expression. Perhaps they leave and the mobilization in exile becomes even more important. Um, Dima, you've been living here since a while and you have been working in a cultural organization that works together with authors and artists in exile. You're also an author yourself. Um, and you have been seeing the efforts in supporting authors and artists in exile. What would you say are the strengths and weaknesses here when it comes to supporting the engagement of authors in exile? Um. Sustainability, sustainability. <laughs> um, I work in a project called Weiterschreiben, and Weiterschreiben, if for the one who doesn't really know, uh, it works with authors uh, who find uh, difficulties in publishing in their own countries, or they forced to leave, and now they are living in uh, Germany. Um, we translate texts, we publish them, we try to uh, introduce them to the German literary scenes by uh, connecting them with also established German authors and uh, make readings, uh, also network them with the uh, journalism and media here. So this is actually the core of our work and we work now with more than 10 countries, network, uh, 10 countries network and uh, authors from there. And also we combine our work also with artists and with these musicians. And one of actually the main problems, if I may say, in the uh, project um, is that we, the need for what we are doing, we always have many requests from uh, many authors way beyond our capacity to cover. Uh, the projects that actually in this field are very, very few. I think Weiter Schreiben is one of the uh, first and still continuing until now. And really we have always very much waiting list and languages we can't cover, uh, more authors that we would love to have, more ideas that we love to have, but it's always the matter of capacity and the matter of funding. Uh, most of our fundings as always in a year base, and this is really a problem. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen next year. You can't apply for the same project. You have to come up with this a new idea. And this is always a challenge. Why we can't grow at the same place and have more people and have more ideas, of course. But it's always like this, like the first of the year, you're waiting for the money, and then you start to work, and then you start at the same time have to think about a new idea and then you have to apply for proposals and then you don't know. You don't know if you're going to continue next year or not. And this of course goes the same for the authors because authors have very, very few uh, access here to the literary institutions. They have really uh, challenges in translation. 
uh, and there isn't really a real support for authors in exile in the matter of translation and the matter of networking and the matter of database. Where can I go? What can I have? What, what, where, how, how should I move? What, what are the institutions that are interested? This is a real, very real challenges and everyday challenges for authors and also for institutions who support artists and authors. Um, and there is another, I mean, the, the pressure to fundraise is a very strong one. And then there is also another pressure, which is sometimes to serve certain stories, right? Or play certain roles. Are you sure? You <laughs> yes. This is really a pressure because um, as a Syrian and uh, as a refugee, and uh, a political asylum status that I have and I can live here, I've been always asked to fill this box. And of course, we live in a world that label, we are labeled, all of us, and we hold our labels that can actually help us to pass our, but sometimes it's not only that I am stuck with those labels, I am also, guided and asked how to fill and fulfill those labels and those boxes. And it's, I mean, of course, with all of my background, this is going to influence my work in somehow. I may write about exile and I may not, but it, 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 my experience is, is part of my, but being always asked, for example, a few weeks ago, I've been asked for a very well-known German institution, media institution, that they wanted to interview me. And I've been asked after nine years in Germany to ask to talk about my life here and to compare it with my life in Syria. It's always the good here and the bad there. And I felt like after nine years, of experiencing life here and working, I'm still not really allowed to talk just about my experience here. How is it for me? It's always I have to do this conversation. It's always that I'm asked, will you be back? And okay, I will be, be back, but would you please stop? <laughs> <laughs> Stop supporting dictatorship in my country. <laughs> so it's, there is always, and and also in in one of our PR members once sent a text to a magazine that they show interest in in publishing one of the texts, and the reply that came from the editor it wasn't about the quality of the text. And it wasn't about that the issue in the magazine doesn't really fit. She typically, she, she, she said, like, really, the topic is not hot. And this is what really authors in exile really facing. So if there is now an attention to what you're writing, you may go with the wave. But when the attention is reduced, you need to fill, you need to fill this box you can't really write on whatever what you want, but you have to write on what now is really needed it's through this box, <laughs> just like this. And it's really a challenge. Um, Anthony, in order for us to expand our perspective beyond just what's going on here domestically or also in terms of German external cultural policy to support artists in exile. Can you tell us something about the work done in the US? Certainly, America has a strong tradition of hosting artists in exile. Is this still the case? Um, is there a lot of attention towards this issue in cultural policy? Uh, well, I think you all understand uh, that public funding in the United States for the arts plays the smaller role uh, between public and say private uh, support. Uh, still, uh, the uh, Biden administration recently reinstated uh, just about a week ago, uh, the President's uh, Committee on Arts and Humanities, which was dissolved by the former president. 
uh, and uh, and the Biden administration successfully increased domestic funding uh, of the arts by twenty more than twenty percent. Uh, the amount is still incredibly modest, uh, uh, probably two hundred million dollars a year for the arts and two hundred million for the humanities in a country our size. It's uh, small. The, the funding uh, for the arts comes chiefly from the private sector uh, with its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in terms of immigration uh, and support for refugee artists and, and creators, I could say that, uh, you know, well, you know that immigration policy is one of the most polarizing flashpoints in uh, our society, uh, marked by uh, stark differences between uh, the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and I would say that for the for creative people, while uh, even the legal status required to uh, enter and uh, remain in the United States uh, is problematic. Uh, I think the resources tend to be uh, reactive. They, they do appear. Uh, so uh, I could say in my experience, I was involved in creating a fund with Ed Bard College for the Threatened Scholars Initiative, which despite its name also provides support to artists uh, for Afghan artists, uh, among others. Uh, we just launched a, a new uh, round of funding for $2 million, which is not going to go uh, as far as, uh, as is needed, but it's something. Uh, uh, but people will move on to the next crisis. So now, you know, there are new funds being generated for Ukrainians. And there's a I'd say uh, a painful uh, and uh, shameful uh, discrimination that goes on. Uh, people of color uh, who were seeking uh, to enter the United States from Haiti at the time of the Afghan crisis, you know, were being uh, abused in the most unspeakable way. And yet Afghans who were kind of part of US foreign policy were being welcomed. Uh, and uh, the uh, and the resources are, are are uneven, so the there are a lot of problems uh, here uh, that one could uh, to dwell on. And uh, one of the strategies internationally that we've been involved with has been establishing uh, ongoing endowments and funds independent from either government or. Uh, uh, the uh, kind of ebbing and flowing of resources. Uh, so we've created uh, three funds. One, the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture, AFAQ, which you, I think some of you know, uh, and then an African Culture Fund. And most recently we're launching a Caribbean Culture Fund. These are independent funds uh, building their own endowments with steady flows of independent uh, uh, support to creatives, uh, both at home and uh, in the diaspora. So I, I believe in the case of Afaq, uh, Arab artists living uh, in uh, in Europe or America could also apply, for example. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jakob Bratschuk, before we leave the topic of exile and diaspora. Could you tell us something about the Belarusian diaspora? Um, are these revolutionary elements that you have mentioned um, in your description of uh, what was leading up to the revolution, So, are these elements transported to life after exile? Do you see a lot of cultural engagement and self-organizing here and how is the support uh, towards these groups? I will maybe start with the support. Um, so let's just briefly remember that we are sitting in Goethe Institute in exile, uh, which uh, is quite 
exceptional for an institution like ours because Goethe Institute has a very territorial structure. That means that each Goethe Institute is doing its activities, realizing its activities in a certain territory, in a certain country. Um, thus, the whole question of exile and diaspora uh, uh, confronts us with a kind of dilemma or a kind of challenge because we would then need to redistribute redistribute the fundings uh, that are supposed to be spent in the respective country in other countries or even like here now in Germany. Um, talking about uh, diaspora and exile, of course in Belarus it's a very good example. Uh, after 2020 there is estimations that more than 400,000 people left, uh, which for such a small sized country is like an enormous brain drain. Um, even if it would be only 120,000, it would be still more than, for example, migration after the uh, suppression of Prague Spring in '68, uh, uh, and we all know how important this was as a kind of European disruption. So in the Belarusian case, we have definitely more than 120,000 who left the country after 2020. Uh, and most of them were exactly from the cultural field, uh, academia, or also s small and medium businesses, or especially IT sector. Um, many of these uh, actors, many of these cultural practitioners, went to the neighboring capitals, Warsaw, uh, Lithuania, of course, as well. Many also went to Kiev and had to flee again after uh, the Russian attack. Uh, a lot of them also came here to Berlin. So Berlin is one of the hotspots of the Belarusian diaspora, I would say. And it's quite interesting to see how uh, the people and the networks develop here. And again, what I mentioned before about this kind of very horizontal structure of the um, of the cultural scene is kind of being reproduced here again. Uh, so we have quite a few initiatives that uh, started around 2020 uh, to um, uh, kind of um, yeah, do their job that they uh, stopped doing in Belarus. They create new networks, they create new initiatives and uh, Coincidentally, we also have some uh, of these uh, protagonists here in our audience. Uh, for example, Ambassada Kulturi, which I see sitting back there. A very nice example of a kind of institutional, um, institutional play, uh, because as there is no uh, real representative or state representation, cultural representation of Belarus possible in Germany, this uh, cultural initiative decided that they will kind of appropriate and do it on their own. So they founded an embassy of culture in uh, Berlin, um, starting with very interesting projects like, for example, to create a kind of civic museum of contemporary art, uh, of contemporary art from Belarus, uh, here in Berlin and online. So um, I would say there is quite a few of these networks and they, uh, they become more and more active. Maybe also kind of in difference to the, uh, to the Ukrainian case, uh, what I sense uh, with Belarusian diaspora is that most of them are not thinking about going back because there is no uh, yeah, it would be first of all dangerous and also kind of it doesn't seem to be possible in the near future to come back so uh, a lot of them really decide uh, uh, very consciously to stay here and to establish uh, their projects and their institutions here um, and again what they imported from Belarus is that they are very horizontal not so much connected to what we know and think of as um, a political opposition. Um, and they, of course, are also very uh, 
closely connected to the local art scene and local cultural scene. Um, and I think coming back to the function of uh, Goethe Institute, um, I think it would be very important that a uh, Goethe Institute creates also the means how to support these diasporic structures because it's even though we invest then the money to let's say german based institutions or german based organizations it's still our ongoing support for the belarusian case and for the belarusian society even though the money is not being spent in belarus but still it helps to enhance the uh, and to support the belarusian culture um, and I would also like to come in a moment back to the question of funding instruments and how we could think more innovatively of them. But before that, um, Jens Adam, you work with the term post-nation state um, cultural policy. Um, to which extent is the Goethe Institute in exile for you a project that you could categorize under this label? Um, perhaps I should say some things about this word, post-national state cultural policy. Actually, it was not my invention, but uh, we had a strategy process uh, in this country to develop a new strategy for foreign cultural policy. And there was a process and working groups and um, people like myself invited to take part in this uh, process. And so, which was structured by the German Foreign Office, and one of these working groups was called Post National State Cultural Policy. Uh, and so, I was invited to contribute to this, and uh, I think the idea was to reflect on uh, I mean, to which extent this whole structures, discourses, objectives, and targets, and working practices of cultural policy are rooted in a thinking of a national state and uh, I think you can um, you can trace this on very different on very different levels like uh, I mean that I mean traditionally the idea was of this German foreign culture policy to to promote and uh, to uh, connect um, uh, German cultural scenes and uh, German language with uh, with scenes abroad so you can see it of course on an infrastructural level when you think how an infrastructure like an institute like a Goethe Institute is, is structured I mean uh, what are what are what is the mission uh, who is deciding there where where is the headquarter and so on so you could could go on uh, discussing this and and but you can you can see this as well in very concrete uh, practices and in, in institutes and, and perhaps I may just share one, one observation because I did research in Ramallah and in Ramallah the Goethe Institute is part of a German French cultural center so you have a French partner and a German partner and it was quite interesting how on a daily level uh, the whole institutional um, life was structured by, by administrative um, administrative guidelines of the national state so, so for instance I mean the two countries have done different budget years, um, the two countries have different ideas about how much a language class should cost and how many hours a language class uh, should have and so on. So basically you have in these, or as well, li how a library has to be structured and so on. So, so you, 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 you meet, what I'm trying to say is you meet this logics of the national state and very concrete institutional practices. So, so talking about this, this uh, Goethe Institute in exile, I, I have to admit that I don't know enough about it. What I like about it for sure is that finally the perspective is turned around because I mean for, for years we are criticizing that this German cultural foreign policy is too much oriented into one direction. So basically everything f flows from here um, uh, to the external, yeah, and basically here is the idea to, that it should flow back, so that it should flow in the very center of Berlin, and um, I like this for many reasons, um, um, but one is that I had always the feeling that what is going on in these Goethe Institutes 
in just as one example, because I did research in Goethe Institutes, but we could think about other cultural um, actors. What is really taking place um, in these Goethe Institutes in concrete fields of practice is so creative and innovative and interesting, and it's really, uh, really a pity that not more of it flows back. Um, flows back. So, so okay, for that reason, I like it. And the second thing which I probably like, but we would need to discuss it, is um, that it hopefully creates spaces where artists can do art, where writers might be able to write, where directors might be able to to, to do films and so on. And that's now a question that I have. Um, I don't know if this Goethe Institute in Exile offers that kind of spaces because I think that should be the case. So that it's not just that artists are invited to show their film for one evening and then they uh, then they uh, go home, <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, or whatever. So then that's, that's basically it. Um, so I think what it would need is or, or I would be interested to in which extent it offers spaces and structures where uh, artists in exile can really do what they want to do and what they need to do, art, um, literature, and so on. So that would be a question. Thank you. I mean, of course, I did not ask the question so you could say, yes, of course, it is a post-nation state. I asked the question so you could complicate the picture for us so that you, we could talk about the conditions under which it might be more leaning towards a more progressive project, which would mean, as you said, transfer inside. So um, a problem I think that we often face with cultural projects in exile is that it is seen as an island. Here it is on its own and here is the rest of the German cultural scene. And this interaction probably needs to happen more. Um, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that there will always be exiled authors and art, always. And they were always a very essential part of the cultures that they are exiled in. So it's really sometimes it's strange as it's frustrating that they are always you said they're not really considered as part of the flow of the culture in the German. I mean, I, I think for Weiter Schreiben, for example, it's not just that it's introducing exiled authors to the German scene, but it, it's also in reaching the literature German scene for those aspects and with these voices. So it's really an exchange, but it's always sometimes like considered that it's just something temporary and it's not, it's going on, it's, it's not part of. So, and for Goethe Institute in Exile, for example, it's really great and it's really, I wish that it has always its own permanent programs that's happening and it's a real space to authors and artists because many of the people come and what they know from the cultural institutions is go to institutes because from the, so maybe it's the first place they may go to. So it would be really amazing if, if they have really a permanent program to support exiled authors because they will always be here. And now we're right in the discussion about cultural policy. Um, Jens Adam, again, about your research. You work with another academic frame called Anthropology of Policy, um, and you have conducted field research, as you've said, in Ramallah and Sarajevo, and you have observed, uh, many of the observations that you share in your writing are really interesting, um, partially about how cultural mediators, the heads of the Goethe Institutes, have to navigate between the different discourses, between the different worlds, what is communicated to them from here, perhaps the center, so to say, as the policy goal, and perhaps what they see as what would make sense in the specific location that they're in. Um, and I'm interested in this frame, anthropology of policy, if you could say some things about this, but also um, if you could analyze the current policy goals that are very progressive, feminist foreign policy, diversity strategy for external cultural policy. These are things that are um, mentioned in the coalition agreement of the current government. Um, 
in light of your field research, what are the risks that you see or what are the opportunities for these policy goals, these big policy goals becoming, having some relevance, let's say, for culture intermediary organizations elsewhere? Um, yes, it works. So, um, so let's perhaps start with this anthropology of policy. So basically it's a critical um, approach towards policy and it tries to develop uh, this whole um, approach. Uh, anthropology of policy tries to develop uh, uh, a different perspective on policy um, than perhaps the still dominant idea that policies are somehow rational, that policies are one-dimensional, that policies are conceptualized by ministers or in parliaments and then implemented, and that policies somehow um, are implemented with, um, with the goals uh, that they should have, so that they d produce the effects that they, that they should have. And basically, um, this anthropology of policy tries to develop a, a perspective on policy which considers uh, policy more like a process of contestation, uh, more like a process of translation, um, negotiation, more like something which connects very different spaces, institutions, actors, resources, uh, and something where we can as well interact, for instance, or intervene, because when we have a processual idea of policy, we can as well think about um, where could we intervene. So it, um, it tries to, 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 um, to somehow complicate our idea about where a policy starts, at which point. So. Uh, and, and all that kind of things, and this is basically the the, the, the perspective I I I, I, um, I use to do research about one new policy approach in in in, in German foreign culture policy. As you said, this idea we should use culture for conflict prevention, which was developed around the year 2000 um, by at this time a green foreign minister and today we have a green foreign minister again so and it was meant as a reaction to um, to the wars in former Yugoslavia and it was um, as well to the war and uh, the genocide in Rwanda so where basically the question is okay so we, we need new instruments we, we need new policy instruments to deal with that kind of um, constellations and we cannot go on just like i don't i don't know promote german german language and german culture we we need to develop new new pro uh, projects uh, new new approaches so and basically i i i i followed this policy in the process of translation so how it traveled from berlin to ramallah and to sarajevo and i was interested in uh, so how this is translated into practice and i mean perhaps to share uh, just uh, one observation, I mean, what was interesting about it from my point of view is how um, how culture mediators in the Goethe Institute uh, reacted to this policy. This, le this then leads to your question about uh, this um, a new policy um, um, somehow uh, uh, change that might come, come next. So basically, when this idea of uh, uh, let's do conflict prevention via culture, arrived in, in places like Sarajevo or Ramallah, then the culture mediators there in the Goethe Institute, uh, they were reacting in a quite ambivalent way. So on the one hand, they were quite skeptical about it, so basically asking all kinds of very relevant questions like, I mean, are we the right people to do a conflict prevention here? Do we have a mandate to do conflict prevention here? Who gave us this mandate? Do we have the competences? Do we have the expertise? Do we have enough money? Do we have the instruments? I mean, all these things. And isn't it much safer basically to do this? What is our unique selling point? Somehow promoting and connecting German, German culture or, or the German cultural scenes with the cultural scenes over here. So shouldn't we just stick to it? So you had on the one hand this skepticism, but on the other hand you had as well an openness, which I think came out of the out of the knowledge that that um, you need to address in, in areas like Sarajevo or in, in, in Ramallah. You need to address basically uh, the conflict and the effects 
of the conflict because it has so many effects on, on cultural institutions, on, on discourses, on, on the ways you can work as an artist and so on. So basically they, they, they acknowledged that, um, uh, that, that we need to address this to be relevant over here and secondly, they, they, I think they, they saw as well it's an opportunity to broaden um, practices of cultural mediators, to, to work with other issues, to, to, to develop new forms of cooperation, to, I don't know, to, to deal with questions like gender relations, for instance, or nationalism, or civic society. So basically to broaden what cultural mediators are doing. And they saw, they saw this opportunity and they used this opportunity. And I think one effect of it is that today we are having much more uh, working forms which work more like a laboratory where new kinds of knowledge is produced, where things are co-created and transnational, transnational teams. Um, and I think these, these new working forms are an effect, perhaps, perhaps even an unintended effect of this policy change so to work via conflict prevention. And I mean, when you ask now about uh, feminist foreign, um, feminist foreign uh, policy, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, basically I would suggest, uh, I would suggest, so uh, drawing on this experience that it would make much sense to think this approach from the fields of practice. So basically, um, f from fields of practices in Sarajevo, in Ramallah, in uh, in all all these in all these uh, places where where the Goethe Institute works, and rather to think what should be done to expand spaces for feminist discourses and practices, instead of basically arguing from our beliefs, our convictions, our, our knowledge, perhaps positions that we consider as correct and, and important and to try to implement them via a transnational network. So here I would argue for turning it around and trying to understand uh, what kind of feminist foreign culture policy might be needed in, in all these places and sites and, and how could it as well trouble our idea about feminism for instance. So a participative approach, not German politicians going to Sarajevo telling people there what feminism should be like. Um, so before we open up for questions from the audience, last question to Jakob Bracek. We heard Anthony uh, Richter talk about the ways in which he has been perhaps innovative in supporting culture and thinking of new funding schemes, establishing endowments in a decentralized way. The Goethe Institute probably cannot do that because it's bound by other bureaucratic hassles. But um, looking into the future, um, also in light of potentially looming budget cuts, strong budget cuts for the Goethe Institute and other cultural intermediary organizations, what are the, what is the way forward, do you think? What do these big cultural institutions like yours have to do differently and how can they oppose the pressure of the budget cuts? I don't think that I will have a comprehensive answer on that question, uh, but at least I, maybe I have kind of three attempts of an answer. Uh, one attempt uh, or one model could be already uh, such ways of uh, uh, deteriorated work as uh, a good institute in exile is uh, representing and you also mentioned that it's also very important to create new and different forms of or opportunities of production and co-production so good institute in exile could be one very nice model for it another one that is uh, extremely uh, important and um, almost trivial uh, that in a lot of this contexts uh, where we are working, we need to provide people with more opportunities of mobility. Um, I'm talking now only uh, about the Belarusian case, but uh, for many uh, people in arts and culture, it becomes more and more impossible to travel, uh, to move uh, between different countries. So we see it now in Russia as well, in Belarus, in a lot of different countries, they become more and more isolated. 
um, this is not only true when we talk about human traffic, uh, but also about money transfer, like uh, Belarus is almost cut off from uh, SWIFT system, same as Russia, so um, it's kind of from both sides um, quite uh, impossible to support uh, financially. And that brings me to the third model that uh, for an institution like ours sounds still like science fiction, but I think it's very important to learn from uh, the civil, society, civil societies and actors in the field. And what we see in Belarus is that a lot of people, like I mentioned, these crowdfunding campaigns, uh, they were, since they were closed by the government, they kind of went into underground. It's kind of a typical Belarusian uh, tacit knowledge. Uh, as soon as the power becomes too strong, people become partisans and go kind of in the underground. And we have uh, in our, let's say, digital or virtual world also some means of going underground financially, and this is cryptocurrencies. Uh, and um, again, like it's a, it's a normal practice in Belarus. Almost everyone has a wallet uh, and is trading with uh, cryptocurrencies. Just as the good old institutions are not yet there. I don't know how to get there, but I think uh, it would be important to learn also from this tacit uh, local knowledge. Um, okay, so let's see if there are questions from the audience. We might have time for some. Yeah, thank you so much for the interesting uh, discussion. I have a question for Dr. Adam. Um, I found it a bit problematic, this definition of soft authoritarianism that you provided, because you said okay, there's no physical violence against, I guess, against the majority society, because who are we talking about against refugees, against queer people? There is already physical violence. So how do you make sure that in your research project you're really um, having a critical reflection on the lenses that you use defining who is actually um, already uh, feeling this. Because if, I think if you ask someone, it's my guess, in Poland, a queer person that is already fighting against the regime since long time, maybe it sounds a bit almost sarcastic to call it soft authoritarianism. So how do you make sure that you don't see it through a majority um, perspective um, that in your uh, project? This is my first question, and I think that's something that is um, important. And the second question is more in general towards the, the festival. It's called Goethe Institute in Exile. And I wonder, you all agreed on the, on the panel that it's important to have some, for the Goethe Institute to create some sustainable and solid structures where artists and, and people in exile can meet and exchange and, and, and live. Um, but how do we make sure, I mean, there are, if we see it through intersectional approach, um, how do we make sure that it's not only a place for a small intellectual elite? Because I never understood why we call it exile. I don't know what is the difference between a refugee and, and someone in exile, you know? I mean, why is it, who is ex, uh, called someone in exile and who is a refugee? And I think there is a kind of a connotation to it, you know? Exile sounds more elegant and sounds as if it's connected to high culture. And someone who is not making high culture might not con be considered exile because it's glamorous to be in exile and it's dirty and not, um, um, not desirable to be uh, uh, just an underground artist refugee you know what i mean that's th my point so how can we assure that it's not just a moral fig leaf for the germans to have these structures when in, in case we just uh, support a small intellectual elite um and make the separate classes separation between the people that come to us thank you um 
So we'll start in a moment with soft authoritarianism, but perhaps I can say something about the notion of exile, because I have I, I used to work at an organization, actually Dima and I were former colleagues, and we were thinking about this a lot, which label, which saying to use refugee artist, and Dima can say more about this in a moment, but you can you don't escape the pressure of the labels and exile has a tradition has a literary also tradition and of course you know the work of Edward Said and yes this is probably elitarian but you might sometimes want to escape certain pressures that the word refugee brings in German society so maybe Dima will say more but can you start with uh, the question on soft authoritarianism um, and the majority lens well I mean basically the I think the idea was to try to make clear what might differ Belarus from Poland. So I think this was a starting point where, from where I started to argue. And I think there are differences between Belarus and Poland. And I think one is that the government in Poland is democratically legitimated and uses this democratic legitimation to reduce um, democracy, to, to basically undermine principles of democracy. And the second thing, I actually spoke, I actually spoke about, um, about violence at the margins, but, 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 and I actually do research at the border, I just come back from the Belarusian-Polish border, and where exactly violence is taking place against people trying to cross the border still from, from Belarus, Belarus to Poland. But what I was trying to say, and I would um, stick to this is that physical violence is not um, a main organizing principle of this political yes I would say it's used yes I would say it's used at the margins right now and um, and it is even used to build something which I would say uh, which I would call a moral community of those that belong to um, the Polish normalized nation in a way. So I think violence has a certain effect, violence at, at the margins, to create uh, this idea of who belongs and who doesn't. And I absolutely know about violence against queer people in Poland. I, I know absolutely about violence against uh, racified, uh, racialized others and uh, against migrants, but I still would say there's a different different um, character of this violence than the violence in Belarus. That's, this was basically the, the main argument. Yeah, I think my problem is with what you call margins. I mean, who defines what is margins? Mm. Mm. I think we agree that it is something really important to keep on thinking about. And I, yeah, I also just took it in and um, thank you. I think we will continue discussing this. Um, Dima, would you like to say something about the labels? Um, well, it's, it's a very difficult que question, actually. But I think exile actually has the uh, biggest umbrella. I would say, because it's always a matter of papers and what the kind of resident permit you have. And so exile maybe is the uh, uh, most known, the oldest one, and the biggest umbrella. I mean, when I, I remember, like, I was here in late 2013, but I remember like in 2015 when what so-called refugee crisis happened, and a lot of refugees actually were really very sensitive to the word refugees because it's it's linked to really almost every negative in the society and some people started to uh, use the term newcomers and uh, it takes time until you reclaim their narrative and you say no I'm a refugee, and I am a refugee because I have a cause, a political cause. And I'm a refugee because of the failure of what so-called leading world countries in dealing with my, the dictatorship in my country. And 
it it it's it's really and it's different to people and i think like exile because some people okay they are forced to leave but they can stay or choose the place where they are some people are not so maybe exiles cover all <laughs> but it's always the pressure of labels wh whatever the word or the term that you use at the end okay uh, there's another question over there I am a refugee, not because of failure of my country, but because of failure of another country. Thank you. Okay, are there any more questions? No. Ah, there is another question. Um, maybe a question to um, that touches on, on what all of you have said, because um, so it seems to me that this uh, that cultural policy is, uh, especially as it is uh, enacted by the Goethe Institute um, and state actors, is very much premised on this very structural relationship between us and them, and and the center and the metropolis. And from what you've all said, is that there are all these learnings that are happening for the let's call it the home nation or our own institutions, um, especially with a view, I'm thinking like, like feminist foreign policy. I mean, neither the foreign office nor Germany are feminist places. So, where do, so I'm wondering like, where does the learning that's happening, um, how does that translate into institutional changes here? How does that trouble the notion of German identity or, or the German nation. Thank you. Actually, if I may take that question to Anthony, who is not based in Germany and does not work for a German institution, but certainly has to deal with institutional change and constructive critique coming from elsewhere and having to incorporate that and making sure that the cultural practice does not remain isolated from the rest of the organization. How do you deal with that in your work? Well, I think that we're, we have a rather different uh, model of operation. The, uh, it's the fundamental principle of our work is uh, local knowledge and that the uh, funding is decentralized uh, and that people who live in a particular geography have the responsibility for determining what the strategy for using our funds are. So it's, uh, I would say that there's, uh, you know, we're uh, divided into uh, six different units uh, and each one of them is located in different, those uh, respective geographies and continent of Africa and Asia Pacific and so on. And uh, teams that live and are people who come from those places uh, determine what the, the, uh, the main funding strategies are. Um, and uh, so that's, I guess, one of the ways that we try to contend with the uh, tensions that the questioner is raising about the power of, uh, of money uh, and uh, its origins and its diffusion. And so I guess procedurally, you know, we, we approach it in that way. One of the main ways that I've learned to get to know the Goethe Institute, however, uh, was around this whole question of, which does not seem to be covered in the uh, definitions of cultural policy that we've been looking at, but it's probably one of the areas of great innovation in, uh, in Europe right now is the, uh, the policy of restitution of colonially looted African cultural heritage. Uh, and it's somehow uh, a piece which Goethe Institute uh, was part of evolving theoretically and discursively with people on the continent of Africa, 
but it's now kind of moved into overdrive. And it doesn't seem to be part of the normal cultural policy uh, that Goethe Institute is carrying out in tandem with the, the German state. Uh, it's a kind of uh, restorative justice, a, a form of uh, reparation which sits some a little awkwardly adjacent the questions of the Herrera Nama uh, genocide, uh, but which is very much a proactive uh, and it's also a part of German foreign policy and uh, it's somehow also finding its place in the Erinnerungskultur uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Germany. So there are, seems to be rooms in the theoretical conversation also for taking on board, uh, which Germany has, you know, the uh, longstanding demands in the cultural space for justice uh, from the continent of Africa and Germany is beginning to make steps uh, in the right direction. Uh, it's different from, uh, very fundamentally from what National Institute of Culture is doing, but it's something that I appreciate. And it kind of, in a way also respond, uh, is a expression of the way in which cultural policy uh, at least in the German context, uh, is responding to strongly felt needs uh, for justice coming from the continent of Africa. I had to work that in somehow because it's a major issue that is uh, uh, present in German uh, cultural policy. Thank you so much for finding a way to work it in. And um, I mean, the question of restitution is mentioned next to feminist foreign policy and the diversity strategy for external cultural policy as those new progressive policy goals or packages, let's call them, in the coalition agreement. And our dialogue series tries to tackle these progressive issues and look at to how, to which extent are they actually serious and how can we make them more serious and what are the different um, disciplines, research, cultural practitioners, civil society saying about this. Um, our next panel discussion is happening already next Friday and it will look at the power of money and the asymmetries that come with it in the culture intermediary um, institutions. Um, thank you to Mark andre Schmachtel from the Goethe Institute and Open Society Foundations. Yes, you want to say something? Yeah. I will Okay. Yeah. I do appreciate your effort and you, sir, um, for this cultural integrity and for this cultural diversity and collaboration. I need you to remember what you're saying. All of you here who hear me now, it's a war. My people are dying. My people are now getting homeless my people appreciate still this event for this we need we need to collaborate but do remember one word war important thank you so much <laughs> okay so thank you um, and also to open society foundations and this dialogue series is part of a study um, if you want to learn more about it there are documents over there on this table but you can also talk to us thank you so much for being here thank you very much caroline thank you the panelists thank you anthony for joining from Lviv. Thank you.
dear audience, for participating. I hope this will not be the last time we see you here. We have a follow-up discussion tomorrow, actually, um, on the definition, actually, on, on the, it continues, actually, this, the, the discussion here. What is an artist in exile? Is it, what is the definition, actually? So it is, uh, we will continue this discussion as well on the role of institutions in the support of, of exile artists. And I think it will be, again, some um, uh, uh, challenging discussion tomorrow, starting at 5 p.m. And uh, today, right now, we have uh, more performances in this uh, building as well, a night-long performance as well. So just take this program, grab it somewhere if you see it, and I hope to see you again. Thank you very much, and have a great evening.